I'm here with Alex Laird and I'm honoured to be here. Uh, she's going to show us the life and the world of a medical herbalist. Alex um, set up the first herbal medical clinic in a hospital dermatology department at Whips Cross in East London. Back when I first had my daughter 20 years ago in 2000, millennium, <laughs> um, and she's a tutor practitioner for Hartwood there. Um, she's also practiced for the past 20 years at Breast Cancer Haven in London and runs a private clinic. She's just told me that the reason why she's, she knows of Wazing, where we're going to be running in a, um, a, a retreat soon, is because she's, I think, family members with the Artful Badger that some of the audience will know, um, an extraordinary creative uh, duo, I think it is. Um, but anyway, that, that's, that's just, Alex's world is absolutely astoundingly fascinating because she has so much knowledge about what plants can do for us and what being in nature can do for us. She's also written a book, Root to Stem, uh, which was published by Penguin in 2019. And I've recently been telling people that I'm working with Alex and so many of them have said I've gifted so many of Alex's books to people. So it's an absolute honour to have you here, Alex. Um, and I'm really excited to work with you at the retreat too in the end of April. Uh, first of all, I wanted to ask you, what got you so excited um, and when? When did you decide to focus on medical herbalism? Well, I think I actually decided to focus on it um, when my own previous career, I felt I'd come to the end of my dozen years in television. I wasn't really enjoying it. It was tough trying to sell ideas. Um, and in a way, I was reverting back to... Uh, a kind of an epiphany I'd had when I was standing on the shores of Loch Lomond, where I lived in Scotland, which was a sense of this nature that is around us is just so mind blowing, so extraordinary. It's not, it's more than just the beauty. It just happened to be a very beautiful summer morning or autumn morning, I think. And I was about 14, I think. I can't really remember. But I remember thinking, what do I do with this great feeling? of, if it's in a sense, kinship, but or, or are of the natural world. And, um, and I was very lucky to be brought up, you know, outdoors a lot, sailing and walking and things like that. And it wasn't until going through television and then getting depressed and feeling I wasn't going in my direction, whatever that was, that I had to find my direction. And, and I trained, uh, suddenly thought, well, for pleasure, because that's a very important driver for life, I would um, train as an aromatherapist. And I did that with Gabriel Moje, uh, the Institute of Traditional Herbal Medicine and Aromatherapy, who takes a, a, both a scientific and a Chinese medicine approach to the essential oils and understanding how, what health is. And that was really revelatory and hugely pleasurable too. And then I started practicing and I happened to get four clinics running very quickly with HIV, people with HIV um, uh, in a hospital for staff, occupational health, uh, Coca-Cola and another HIV drug using center. And so very quickly was learning a lot about clinical work, how to work with many different people with many different conditions. And quite soon after that, read a book called um, by Simon Mills called The Essential Book of Herbal Medicine, also published by Penguin. And that was absolutely revelatory as well. It developed Chinese herbal medicine ideas, but also science. And I suddenly realized there was this profession called herbal medicine, and you could be a Western medical herbalist, um, along with all the other great traditions like Chinese medicine or Ayurveda or Unani Tib, which is the Islamic form. So yeah, that's how it all came about. I suddenly realized, my God, my love of nature is, un is underpinning this drive and interested in healing. And, you know, we deal with our own trauma. How can we heal ourselves and others? So that's, that's the long version. Oh my God. No, it is. It's, it's, you jumped from Scotland as a 14 year old girl where your childhood sounds absolutely idyllic. Well, the beauty that you're surrounded by, amazing. And then, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I wondered whether when you first started 20 years ago, um, the world is a very different place. Uh, what's the difference in the world of now to, you know, to then? Well, I think, you know, herbal medicine has always been slightly under the radar because we have the domination of a more um, 
you can say reductionist, scientific, only scientific. Science is great, but it can be too limited in the way that it's actually practiced by in medicine. And so the drug driven, pharmaceutical driven medicine, um, which is man made drugs, usually some of which can be life saving. Nevertheless, the um, approach can be very limited. It's not taking into account the whole human. So I think that maybe 20 or 20 you know, three years ago, longer when I started, um, herbal medicine was under the radar, Western herbal medicine. Chinese herbal medicine was more out there, partly thanks to acupuncture um, being widespread and having more research. But China, Western herbal medicine has had very little research. And that's the problem, that it wasn't really widely accepted. But of course, there are people, most people vote with their feet and they know that modern medicine is too limited. It's not looking at how everything is connected. So illness in one person is, is unique because it depends on what's going on with them, even though the pathology, the sum of that may be in common with your eczema or my eczema or my by IBS, your IBS may be will have slightly different factors. So understanding that and the pathology of that is something that we in Western herbal medicine, modern herbal medicine, uh, absolutely go into. So we look at all the, the science, the pathology, but we also focus much more widely than modern, than, than, than drug um, so-called orthodox medicine does on the individual and really tries to see them wholly as spirits, social, emotional, physical mix. And I think now there is a lot of dissatisfaction with the way that the NHS has gone and the GPs say you can only see them for seven minutes and you've got to come up with one, one problem, not two or three or four or five, which as all the poor GPs themselves know is really not the way it should go but it's sort of being run maybe by accountants and too much measuring and not enough trust in really highly trained uh, medics and or yeah so I think there's now a real interest uh, among the public you know partly due to that dis dissatisfaction with a more holistic approach and also seeing people who are properly trained and know what they're talking about or try to know what they're talking about yeah and obviously the, the lockdowns and the, the way that we were catapulted outside, many of us who hadn't done that much of that before, catapulted outside and, and feeling the benefits of being in nature and learning then, well, wow, I feel better and inquiring as to why and maybe stumbling across some of the, um, some of the um, experiments or what well, not experiments, but research they were doing to do with echinacea and how that was affecting our yeah. immune system. I mean, there is more, there is actually a lot of research out there. A lot of it is actually done by pharmaceutical companies or, or universities for pharmaceutical companies, mm. you know, trying to find, but they're always, they tend to be trying to find the active ingredient yeah. in a plant. And actually a plant species, let's just take dandelion or nettle, may have up to theoretically 50,000 different phytochemicals. So they may not have them all at the same time because a plant like a human is responding and making phytochemicals, phytonutrients in response to its environment. If suddenly a, a fungus comes along and the plant is responding by making a chemical for that fungus, um, which it might not make if the fungus is you know, much more, uh, much lower, if you like, not a threat. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's all these colors and tastes that we in uh, herbal medicine, and I'm a phytotherapist, that means plant therapist. Yeah. So I was going to say, for the benefit of the audience who don't know what phytochemicals are, um, you will explain it best, but they are literally the wires through, invisible wires through which plants communicate with everything else that's living. They, they do, and um, exactly, they are those small compounds that they are making in addition to the, the structural stuff, the proteins, fats, carbs, um, and in addition to the vitamins and the minerals that they have, uh, they are also making this third group. I mean, we, we decide that's a group. Uh, that We divide up these things in this way. In the phytochemicals or phytonutrients, same thing. And those are what are usually sought after by or used by pharmaceutical companies as drugs like digoxin, which comes from foxglove or, um, you know, very often alkaloids. But uh, there are literally thousands of other phytochemicals, phytonutrients that are 
super important for us, without which we cannot survive. We might be able to build tissue, but our immune systems, our liver function, our circulatory function, all those blood vessels. Our ability to feel good, our ability to feel pleasure and feel good. Our ability to feel the tastes, and they are literally the colours and the tastes. I mean, some of the most of them are that the stinging nettle itself has got all kinds of acids and um, neurotransmitters. It also has the same neurotransmitters that we have in our brain. Yeah. Um, the plants have the same internal clock as we do. They do. Yeah. I mean, some there'll always be variations, but you're right. The internal body clock to do with light and dark has governed, you know, the evolution of plants and animals. Yeah. Yeah, and we need to follow that more closely. Hence, your, it's really lovely to hear you so you know, engaged and sharing this knowledge about how we fit into na- the rest of nature, because we've only evolved as a result of those rhythms and, and cycles and seasonal cycles and so on. And we need to re- understand what those are and, and understand our reliance, utter reliance on plants. Exactly. And, and, their pl- and their insects and the animals that, yeah. you know, part of that whole thing. Yeah. And as you said, how important it is. Do you want to um, recommend that book um, that you wanted to donate? Um, well, yeah. I just think how it's important it is to have nature at, at the table, you know, breakfast with us, but also uh, at business meetings and governmental meetings. Well, quite. And it's a, it's a book by Stefano Mancuso, who some people, so Stefano Mancuso, and he um, is a professor, he's a, a specialist in plant intelligence, a researcher in plant intelligence in, I think, Italy, certainly is an Italian. Mm-hmm. And The Nation of Plants, a Radical Manifesto for Humans. And what he yeah. does so beautifully, you don't have to, it's not a long book. He's basically summing up in an impassioned, but completely evidenced way, why humans rely utterly on plants. And this is an expert in plant functions. And then he gives them their rights. So it's at saying why they need their rights. And I can't remember how many rights he gives them. But anyway, it's a short book and it's really worth looking at because he's... Yeah. Amazing. So let's talk about your book then. Yeah. Herbal, medical, for our bodies and our lives. And for what is your, what did you choose as your one tip? Um, I know you're going to go through the kitchen at some point, but I, is, that, is that going to be given to us in the kitchen? Yeah, I, I think I should just say something before that. I, we, we are going to go to the kitchen um, uh, because that will illustrate what I'm talking about with what are phytochemicals and what they do. But the one thing that's really worth saying is that you can see behind me here, we've got some tinctures. I've got about 200 or so tinctures. So... Let's just get one that maybe everybody's heard of. So um, I would mix these up, um, maybe five, six, seven. This one is rosemary. And just for the people who can't see the video, um, Alex has got a um, cabinet behind her of of, um, bottles of tinctures. And she's holding a rosemary tincture up now. What we do is we... we, um, We would, a medical herbalist would, uh, or a herbalist who's using Western herbal medicine, and by the way, Western herbal medicine doesn't mean that they're only plants that are found in the West, but they are very often, because we do use plants. Plants are no respecters of borders, so, you know, but there are slight differences. So a a Chinese medicine practitioner would use licorice, but it's a slightly different form of licorice, a slightly different species than we would use. Um, but we do use plants from around the world. That's certainly true. Um, but that we would mix, say, five, six or seven, maybe um, herbs together from those tinctures and make one bottle and, and give 100 mils a week, for example. That might be a typical dose. Uh, but we can also give herbs in lots of other ways. You've got lots of um, dried herbs and roots and so on which is slightly, it can be cheaper and easier, but more time from the patient who has to boil things up together. Or they can make long infused teas, which if they're strong enough, will be medicinal. So yeah, that's, that's really how we, we can give tablets and pills and all sorts of things. But the idea is that we're really trying to boost the resilience. We're trying to boost the different functions in the body that are relevant to whatever the symptoms are, yeah. you know, the underlying causes of a particular condition. Yeah, Bio- exactly, as well. exactly. Obviously, addressing the living 
I love I love the fact that it's just inside our tummy it's just flora and fauna and um I, I think sometimes you mentioned someone said the other day to me, what's flora and fauna I was like wow there are people who <laughs> because but there's yeah. an engineer actually who was that but flora and fauna is, is what we see in a meadow but we actually have that in our tummies and it's an important we don't just have the oh, skin, actually, yeah. flora in our tummies. We have we have microbes which are symbiotic with us, i.e. they work with us. They're our partners. And we have far more of those cells that we do than our own human cells, because that's what life is. Life is all about, yes, some competition, but a great deal more collaboration and cooperation. That is the hallmark of life is one cell saying to another, you know, I can do not business with you, but I can do this and you can do that. So let's get together, you know, and make something bigger. And that's what happens in um, in the microbes that we've got all these amazing microbes, viruses, bacteria. They're mostly bacteria mm -hmm. and some good, less some others not so good. And it's the community of the bacteria that keep them uh, keep a balance there. And when we get out of balance, then one a bacteria like Candida, for example, Candida will Candida albicans is the proper Latin name will actually change its nature, and you can have Candida on the skin, um, living naturally, but in a low way. It's when it gets out of hand and it starts dominating, and it's the same in the gut. You know, there are lots of more anti-inflammatory microbes in the gut. We've got them in the nose, in the hair, on the skin, but. The most research that is being done at the moment is really on the gut, but certainly relevant to skin and skin function, because yeah. they're basically helping to as acidify the surface of the skin, which is another natural, what we call an innate immune mechanism, sort of the most topmost layer of immunity that repels uh, other less friendly bacteria if you keep it acidic. Yeah. Wow. There's so much to know um, and there's so much to learn. I, I also wondered whether, am I right in thinking that the it's, it's incredibly important to, to engage in medical herbalism from a preventative point of view, because if you um, do let your internal, for example, your gut biome deteriorate, um, it is very hard to come back from, almost like when you put on a lot of weight, it's very hard to lose. Is that true? Is it, can it deteriorate so far that it starts to create unwanted diseases and then also is very hard to build up again or is, is that all right? I think it, it, it is hard. You know, when our bodies get into a, a rhythm, a routine or habituated to, let's say, weight, it does. It is difficult to shift because partly you have to know as an individual, what is it in my case that is... Um, you know what is what is driving my hunger or my desire for the carbs or what is is there a metabolic disorder that's that's got very comfortable you know and how can I yeah so it can be it can be difficult to identify in order to then solve mm. and then to change it can be difficult because all our, all of us find it difficult to change our habits um but once you do make changes, you know, the body is always, it's been designed, it's, it has a design, and usually the design is for health, that's the default. Mm. So our job is to really utilize everything we can about, or understand everything we can, or go to an expert, you know, whoever that may be, in how do we build resilience, how do we build back the habits, the circadian rhythm, you know, the daily rhythm that we are actually fundamentally designed for. Because then we're going with the grain, we're following the grain, we're not going against it, we're not putting stress basically on our bodies of, you know, various sorts of stress. So that's the thing. So, what we, you know, and actually all the old, that's the beauty about those other traditions of herbal medicine. Or natural medicine traditions around the world like Chinese herbal medicine, Chinese medicine and Ayurveda and so on is they're always looking at our interaction with the environment, seasons, cold, hot, you know, what is the environment in which we move but one can and, and, and how do we need to adapt to that and how are we designed to adapt to that so that they always have a really intelligent, deeply intelligent holistic approach to this and that's what we're trying to do is to understand that deeper relationship between us and our environment. But we create environments 
through the emotion. Yeah. How far, how far, you know, what you just said about the, the whole holistic and coming at it from, and, and what I'm hearing is a very, everyone has a very unique homeostasis. But it's also a, a, the whole thing has to be looked at from a whole. And then what you were saying about the NHS saying, well, we can, have, can treat one thing, but, you know, at one time, it's so far from it. And it's so then very important to engage in. And people do vary a lot, you know, literally. That, that is the key thing. And so you have to take the individual as an individual. Yeah. Because we've all had different, got different genes, we've got different epigenetics. Those are the conditions that switch on or don't, you know, the foods that we eat, all the other emotions that we have in the body, all of these will affect our health. And we have to figure out in that individual what's causing that particular, what are the factors that are leading to that particular problem, even though you can still study the, the, the pathophysiology, you know, of a condition, of a, of a skin problem or a gut problem or a cancer or whatever it is. And the goal is to try to find a place where you're most comfortable and resilient and naturally resilient and naturally calm and you're not having to think oh my god this is happening to me I must be resilient it's sort of you're, you already have a natural state well, it, it's reintroducing it's reintroducing yeah. better rhythms learning about sleep what is repair sleep when does it happen mm -hmm. when do can I eat to remove the stresses from my body you know like eating late at night which mm -hmm. now and again it may be fine but not as a habit that's mm -hmm. And actually, maybe it's even good to break the habits, to reinforce them again when you go back to them. But it's it's not that you've got rigid, you've got to do this between this and then. It's more about a much more relaxed, but nevertheless rhythmical approach to living. And, um, and I think it's, you mentioned preventative. I think it's much more about health is a state that is in a way the natural state also illness is a natural state it's just the body saying hey you've pushed the boundary too much here mm. now we're going to re-establish the rhythms the beneficial foods the functional eating more pleasure in life following your heart all of these basic things that have been known forever mm -hmm. all the traditions are saying that you know um that by the way, actually, Lara, there was a wonderful, and it's still available, you know, the, um, it was an excellent, Yes to Life was running with the Penny Bronze Centre, which is a cancer support centre in Bristol. Really wonderful. The excellent four days over two weekends um, of uh, a cancer conference, cancer support conference with, you know, leading thinkers around the world, so specific in their helpful advice um really really excellent and um i think it's your life and cancer uh, and they were just reinforcing all the things that we think now there's much more evidence to support how best to support ourselves through cancer or and it's it's about saying that health is the underlying way that we are designed and it's just about finding out and it's not simple i'm not saying that you know it's not about curing cancer necessarily but it's about how do we live well with disease it may be that the disease can go you know that we can overcome that being a dominant thing but it's much more about how do we live well with disease because diseases so-called are often just the body's way of saying you are pushing the boundary here so what do you need to do differently how will you live well what are you doing in your life that isn't following your pleasure and effectively being healthy for you and maybe the people around you and bernie siegel the very famous doctor who's now 89 and still going super strong uh, who wrote Love, Medicine and Miracles and many, many, many books and is, was a surgeon mm. as well as a, 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 and a doctor. I mean, he was a great listener to his patients and a great encourager and a great educator for his patients. And really, that's what we are, I think, as most practitioners. And we need to be individually. I think we need to listen to our bodies with the support of practitioners. And so I think that and I felt myself that being outside, and luckily I was, I'm just an outside person. I always wanted my anorak as a child, but similar to you, I've always, I've now realized how I can hear myself. And I, yeah, and, and the cost myself by being outside the big dose of nature mm. um, and then um, applying it through herbal medicine and other therapies. Well, you're a very good example, Lara. That's the point that, you know, we don't have to be doctors or medical herbalists or nutritionists or to teach each other. It's peer to peer, you know, and you're 
you've got lots of wisdom and you're sharing information that is, it, you know, that's that's how yeah. it would work, really. It's much more powerful often coming from each other yeah. than from an expert, so-called. Yeah. So, but that, that's that's sharing knowledge is absolutely key. And that's it about what makes health. And yeah, our own experiences can often be very powerful. Yeah. Um, that's what I like people to do with my whole my whole um, sort of mission is I'd love people to just wake up in the morning and think of nature you know, and, and, and have biophilia or the love of nature as our leading language rather than money as our leading language or you know, yeah. stuff, so. and all those systems you know like the microbes themselves you know the same communication systems similar genetic systems not always exactly the same but they've all we have evolved from plants you know that it, there's the same very similar mechanisms are going on because they evolved to make a more complex group of cells and organisms and tissues like the human or the mammal yeah. so you so know we just... yeah it's incredibly important <laughs> we level up you know with each other uh, with animals and with nature to um yeah to be able to hear what's what's best for us and what's best for the planet actually you know how we tend to put you know on a pyramid the the human at the top this is all so so um uh not correct not right it's not not doesn't reflect what is actually happening in our in in yeah. life and it, uh, really humans are at the bottom <laughs> but the, the the pyramid is should be upended and the plants at the top you yeah. know humans yeah. at the bottom who've got far too clever and they're not wise we have to learn wisdom and that we're very very young as a species and we've got a huge amount of learning to do which let's hope we can do before we destroy the plants and the insects and the relationships uh, that support us i think that things like what, what, what we're doing and uh, the people that we know are doing getting together in nature and just uh, you know on the phone and talking to each other about it i think it can really speed um things up and spread good light and good knowledge around so it's exciting and I'm so so happy to have met you so grateful to um, died up there actually to have mentioned you um that we're working together on a retreat in April that's going to be fantastic it'll be, fun. It'll be really yeah. fun um, and resilience it'll be so fun so um now would you like to let us know you can give us two tips if you want but if you um have a, a tip um for us to take away something that people can literally write on a post-it note I'm going to go to the kitchen to show the tip or okay. two. Okay. okay. The point about herbal medicine, it's also, for, it's really mis, misplaced. We should just call it plant medicine because it's yeah. food as well. And that could even include meat and, and, and fish. Well, it does. I mean, if you're an omnivore, I always cover all sorts of foods, but foods, all plants contain their medicine yeah. for themselves and as for us. So yeah, we'll go to the kitchen now. So now we're, we're in my kitchen, surrounded by food, which is also medicine. And first, first thing is to say, look at these amazing grapes. These are actually, uh, as it happens from Waitrose, because it's very difficult to find seeded grapes now. If you want to get lots of immune stimulating polyphenols, you just need to be eating your skins, actually skins of all foods. So these colors are actually among the phytochemicals that are so important to stimulate our white blood cells. And, and the seeds inside are also the key thing to cr crunch because they've got lots of tannins and other really important medicinal phytochemicals. And that's exactly what we're designed to be doing is scrunching those seeds and getting the benefits out of them. There'll be antiviral components in there. So colors, tastes, and eating the skin seeds and pith. Really, that's it in a nutshell. And eating lots of variety and aiming ideally for about 30 different foods a day. That's not 30 fruit and veg. It's 30 different foods. So at breakfast, for example, and the other thing is having slow releasing whole food with masses of fiber, hence the skins. So, for example, here are um, medium, or actually it's coarse oatmeal. Mm -hmm. coarse oatmeal rough coarse or pinhead same thing chopped oat much less processed than flakes on the whole or better than certainly you don't want to make fine oatmeal porridge you want to make coarse oatmeal porridge because it'll take longer to break down in you you're doing the cooking and or you put a couple of tablespoons on your on a smoothie a spoonable smoothie along with 
some lovely seeds, that's three lots of seeds I got in there, pumpkin, sunflower and uh, linseed. Linseed is flaxseed, brown ones, because you've got more color and the colors of the phytochemicals that are so supportive to the immune system and to the gut. And so that's already four items, one, two, three, four, three lots of seeds. Um, maybe some berries, I might even put, so three lots of berries you can get frozen, very, very simple. Those are supporting, again, more polyphenols, mm -hmm. um, more support for the circulation. Very important to keep our blood vessels lovely and open and shiny and flexible. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's maybe seven items. And then we might have another couple of things like um, an apple, a bit of apple, a bit of pear. And you just keep that, take a third of an apple, third of a pear, keep the rest for, for the next days. Um, so that's easily 10. And then maybe some yogurt. I use double cream as well sometimes on my porridge, certainly. Hopefully from an animal that has eaten lots and lots of different plants in a, in a forage. Um, because we're eating what it ate or how it was grown. So breakfast should be, you know, already you can get 10 or 12, 14 even items in there. And that includes things like herbs and spices and so on. Yeah. And then lunchtime comes. And here we've got more wonderful color. This is black rice, very easy to find. I think it might be a Thai black rice. Mm -hmm. That is I mean, there's no comparison between the nutritional value because of the skin, because of the pigments, because of the lovely nutty tastes, which are all the phytochemicals in that, and the fiber that is feeding our gut microbes, among other things, um, which are so central to our health. Those pigments and all those phytochemicals that are still intact, that have been stripped out, as happens in white, white rice, which has basically got nothing in it let except some sugars and a bit of protein tiny bit of protein this is the kind of food that is what we need to be eating so that you know at lunch a couple of tablespoons of cooked that sort of rice or even combining it with beans or tins of beans are fine it doesn't always have to be black i'm just showing how many amazing colors there are uh, beans or lentils preferably black or green or gray lentils and if you combine the lentils and the, and the black rice, you get all your protein. So for those who are vegan, who often don't get enough protein. Yeah. So yeah, the bottom line is you just, here is um, uh, 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 a pumpkin. 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 Yeah, it's a pumpkin, it's a squash. And you want to roast it with the, with the skin and the seeds and eat both. Right, okay. Quite expensive mm. for pumpkin seeds for yeah. their zinc. Yeah, yeah. yeah. lovely. Baked, you know, sweet potato. It's basically roasting lots of these veg is a way, and putting lots of spices and herbs on them is a way of covering all your bases and all those complex functions in the body. Amazing. Wow. That was, I think, a believable tip. Um, I, I, what's, that, what's that one? Cinnamon? In the chili, just for examples, and cinnamon. Yeah. So these are concentrated in their phytochemicals. That's what makes them medicinal. Um, they haven't got lots of, have they? Got lots of sugars and protein and carbs. They're concentrated in those really important healing functional nutrients. And the capsaicin that's in there is the hot thing. It's called capsaicin and it's what makes chili hot to our taste. Yeah. And that has many, many functions in the body. It helps with pain. It stimulates, it's anti-inflammatory in many ways. It opens up blood vessels. So, you know, these, these are what these amazing plants are doing in us. Amazing. You're amazing. Thank you so much for sharing so much uh, with us. And find, find Nara. Keep your, keep your uh, tomatoes out of the fridge. Keep tomatoes out of the fridge. Because that lycopene is one of those very important compounds that that uh, actually, if you if you refrigerate them, it's not active. And this is a very anti-tumor compound, and it's part of the red in the in the tomato. Well, actually, tomato, tomatoes and black grapes are actually my absolute favorites with um, apricots. Lovely talking to you, and thank you so much for your time. Um, really looking forward to um, being in real life with you on the 21st of April um, and um, 
yeah, sending you lots of love from near yeah. Newbury to Fulham, my birthplace. Thank you so much. Okay, Bye. great. Bye. It was brilliant. I love talking to Alex. We have so much to share with you. We are running a retreat in Waving Estate in the Woodlands on the 21st of April. So do come and join us there. We'll learn about it by um, visiting the website botanicshed.com. See you soon. Bye.